everyone. Thank you for joining us today at our June Lunch and Learn and Stop the Bleed during National Safety Month. Today we have Angie Short presenting an RN from the Good Shepherd Emergency Room Department. Thank you so much for joining. So we're going to do it a little bit different than we've traditionally done it, where I do a PowerPoint presentation. Um, they have geared this video towards the virtual version. Um, so we're going to do this video and then we'll do the hands-on section. If you guys are watching, um, you'll just need to somehow get in contact um, with me or Judy, maybe the education department, and we can get you um, a time set up that we can meet you here and we can have you do the hands-on stuff so you can get your certificate. All right. This is the most recent version of the Stop the Weed program. However, it is important to note that this is not the complete course, as there is an additional hands-on practical session that covers all of the core bleeding control skills, which include pressure, packing, and tourniquet application taught by trained instructors. We are providing this resource as a temporary measure, as the COVID-19 pandemic has severely limited the availability of in-person courses. When it is safe to do so, we would strongly encourage you to complete the full course, which includes the practical hands-on skills section. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's move on with the program. Hi, I'm Habiba Park from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, and welcome to Stop the Lead. Stop the Lead is an initiative brought together by the White House uh, in response to the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, which brought together many major organizations, including those listed here, to work on a collaborative effort to educate the public on bleeding control. Though the images that are shown during this presentation may be disturbing, while we try to do our best to limit uh, the graphic content, some of it is unavoidable. Um, and so uh, you will see some of those images here. Now, why do people need this training? The number one cause of preventable death after injury is bleeding. And surprisingly, there are very simple steps that anyone can learn how to do to recognize what life threatening bleeding looks like, intervene, and potentially save a life. Now, what are places where this kind of training could come in handy? While we talk about school shootings uh, and other mass casualty incidents, you can encounter life-threatening bleeding in essentially any situation. One of the most common situations where you can have these incidents can be in motor vehicle accidents. Um, you can find you encounter life-threatening bleeding in situations where there are kitchen injuries or in the household. Another big uh, area where you can find these injuries would be at the workplace. So things like construction zones, uh, garages, uh, lumber yards, essentially any situation where you can encounter a life-threatening injury with bleeding, you might end up needing to use some of the skills that we'll learn today. Now, the steps that we're going to step, learn today uh, are going to be, one, number one, identifying what life-threatening bleeding looks like. And then we'll start implementing the steps of stop the lead. So pressure, packing, and tourniquets are the major uh, steps that we use to stop life-threatening hemorrhage. The very first thing we need to learn is that your safety is first. If you become injured, you won't be able to potentially help others. And there are situations that you might encounter where you might be the only person who knows how to apply these skills. So only help others when you find that it is safe to do so. Always assess the situation first to decide whether or not it is safe for you to intervene. And the situation can evolve. Even if it was safe at first, if the situation changes or becomes unsafe, please stop, reassess the situation, move to safety, and if you can, take the victim with you. Part of safety is protection from the exposure to blood and bloodborne diseases. While this risk is extremely low, you want to be able to protect yourself if you can. So if there are gloves that are available, please use them. If you get blood on you, uh, please be sure to clean that part of your body that the blood has touched. And if anyone is entering the scene, please inform them as well. Say, hey, you know, this person is injured, there's blood here, so that they can also take the appropriate uh, pre precautions. And then once you reach a healthcare provider, please let them know that you have blood on you and follow his or her directions. We're gonna go through this step. Uh, step A is going to be alert. Step B is 
assessment of the bleeding to decide whether or not it was life-threatening, and C is compression or the application of stop the bleed skills. So the first step is alerting or calling for help. So the very first thing you should do even before intervening is to call for help. Either you call 911 yourself or identify someone at the scene who you can directly tell, hey, call 911. If you're direct, the better it is, the more chance that they will go and try to find help. And if you're the lone provider, definitely do this first before you start to intervene. Because if you don't have any equipment or supplies with you, EMS, police, whoever it is that the first responder team is, will have supplies with them and will bring them with them. In calling 911, you want to give them some vital information. You want to know where your location is, and you want to describe what you're looking at. Describe the situation, whether or not the scene is safe, what the injury looks like, and the condition of your friend, colleague, your victim there. And you want to be able to follow the instructions that the 911 operator gives you. Because even if you get stressed and you don't remember basically the skills of stop the bleed, they'll be able to walk you through it. Now, now that you've called for help, the next step will be assessing the bleeding. And this entails looking at and assessing it, trying to decide whether or not this is something that's life-threatening. If you can see in the image here, you see someone who has a pretty large wound on their leg. And you see that there's a large amount of blood there. And so clearly, this is something that could potentially be life-threatening, and you'll want to move on to the steps of stop the bleed. So again, number one, you want to find the source. You want to expose the area, which may mean that you may have to remove some items of clothing in that area so that you can get a very good look at the wound. And then you want to look for signs of potential life-threatening bleeding. So you want to look for things like continuous bleeding, large volumes of blood, or is the blood pooling in the area? All of these could be signs that the victim could be bleeding to death. There could even be multiple places that the person could be bleeding from. As I mentioned, clothing can hide the type of bleeding, so you really want to expose the area and take a look. By no means is this list exhaustive, but there are other things like pulsatile bleeding that may indicate that this is major bleeding. So we like to describe the zones of the body to describe areas where the person could be bleeding. The first area being the arms and legs or extremities. These are areas where you can use all of the methods of compression, including packing, direct compression, or the tourniquet. With the green picture, where you have the neck, armpits, and groin, these are called junctional areas. And in these areas, you can't really fit a tourniquet around them. I would highly recommend not applying the tourniquet around the neck. And you would be able to put direct pressure or packing in these areas. The third region is the torso, or the main portion of the body. Now, as you could just imagine, there's no amount of pressure or compression that you can apply in these areas that will really stop internal bleeding. And you would really have no idea about whether or not there is internal bleeding happening. You also cannot apply the tourniquet around the torso. In these situations, you want to identify people who have injuries to this part of the body. First, EMS. These are the people who are going to end up needing to be transported to the hospital for further care. For, again, for the arms, legs, and junctional areas, like the neck, armpits, and groin, one can apply either tourniquet to extremities or direct pressure or packing to extremity wounds or to the junctional areas. Thank you, Habiba. My name is Dan Grabeau from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. And I'll be taking you through the C portion of our bleeding control presentation. Simply put, to control bleeding, we are going to compress or apply pressure. Pressure will stop the majority of bleeding. Start with pressure. Use a small amount of gauze or cloth-like material, just enough to cover the wound. Excess gauze makes pressure ineffective. If gauze is unavailable, use any clean material, such as a t-shirt. Apply pressure directly to the bleeding site. The application of pressure may require a significant amount of force, and this may hurt a lot. Apply enough force to stop the bleeding 
and continue applying this pressure until help arrives. In the next series of three slides, you will see how to apply pressure to a bleeding wound. Here you will see the application of pinpoint pressure directly onto the site of bleeding. This is an effective method of controlling bleeding. The demonstration in this video will move at a slower pace as to show the process. However, we will need to act fast to control bleeding. Once the person in the video identifies the bleeding, she grabs a t-shirt as she does not have a bleeding control kit with gauze available and applies direct forceful pressure over the wound. This will cause pain to the patient. Do not stop. Again, this is at a slower pace to emphasize the movements. Acting fast is the key as is not letting up on the pressure. If bleeding is from a cavity, superficial pressure may not work and you need to pack the wound deeply and tightly. Be careful as there may be sharp objects or fragments of bone within the cavity. Once the bleeding stops, do not check the wound. Simply hold pressure until help arrives. As before, the demonstration in the video will move at a slower pace as to show the process. Again, fast action is required to control bleeding. Here, the instructor has a bleeding control kit available with gauze. Notice how she exposes the injury and packs the gauze deep into the wound. Then she will apply direct forceful pressure over the injury. As before, this process and forceful pressure will cause pain to the patient. Packing to control bleeding is very useful in many different areas, including the extremities or arms and legs, the neck, armpits, and groin. For injuries to the chest and abdomen area, the bleeding will be occurring internally, and these patients will need to be brought as quickly as possible to a trauma center where bleeding can be stopped. Tourniquets should be considered for extremity bleeding that does not stop with pressure or packing, or the situation does not allow you to maintain pressure on the wound. Following these few rules help in making tourniquet application effective. Apply it two to three inches above the wound. Do not place it over an elbow or a knee joint. Tighten the tourniquet until the bleeding stops and do not remove the tourniquet until help arrives. You can apply a tourniquet on others or even on yourself if needed. A tourniquet can be applied over light clothing. However, remove any bulky clothing, such as a jacket. If the tourniquet is being placed over a pocket, ensure the pocket is empty. Otherwise, the tourniquet will not be effective. Placing a tourniquet is a painful procedure for the victim, and severe pain should be expected. And finally, two tourniquets may be required to achieve hemorrhage control. As before, the demonstration in this video will move at a slower pace as to show the process. And fast action is required to control bleeding. Here, our instructor will apply a combat application tourniquet or CAT to the upper extremity of a victim. The instructor starts by taking the tourniquet opening up the Velcro band and placing it two to three inches above the injury, making sure not to be over bulky clothing or a joint, wrapping the band around the entire arm, passing the band through the buckle and pulling it tight. This removes all slack in the tourniquet. 
it's important to wrap the Velcro band all the way around, to prevent it from turn, coming undone. Once fully wrapped, the windlass rod is tightened down until the bleeding stops and secured in the clip. The remainder of the band is wrapped and the strap is secured and time is marked. This is a painful procedure, but pain does not mean we should stop. Remember, the goal is to stop the bleeding. Also remember not to loosen the tourniquet, but to let trained medical professionals make that decision. Several models for tourniquets are commercially available. The Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, or TCCC, is the resource for the Committee on Trauma Stop the Bleed program for direction regarding equipment. These are a few of the tourniquets that are approved and listed on the TCCC adjunct formulary. However, not every version of the approved tourniquet is shown. You will notice that the mechanisms, the types of tourniquets are different between the windlass rod and the ratcheting types. You may see any of these tourniquets in the field and should become familiar with them and how they work. It is also important to know that improvised tourniquets are difficult to make and apply correctly and may in fact increase the bleeding by compressing venous structures. Their utility has not been scientifically proven and therefore caution should be used when considering their use. This slide provides a list by name of tourniquets approved through TCCC. More information is available at deployedmedicine.com. There are a couple pneumatic limb tourniquets available. They are the Delphi and the Tactical Pneumatic Tourniquet. Techniques to control bleeding in, the chil in children are very similar to what has been presented in adults. As long as they can be properly applied, the same tourniquet can be used in an adult or a child. The child is too small for the tourniquet to be applied properly. Direct pressure on the bleeding wound will almost always work to control the bleeding. Wound packing is the same for both adults and children. Here are a few common questions. Impaled objects should be left in place and not removed. The immediate responder could apply a tourniquet above the object if needed. Professional medical personnel, fire, and EMS are trained to treat victims with impaled objects. Improvised tourniquets, as we have discussed previously, are difficult to make and often do not work effectively. Loss of an arm or a leg, referring to the fear that a tourniquet could result in the victim losing their arm or leg, an immediate responder places a tourniquet on the victim. You need to reassure the victim that placing a tourniquet will save their life and far outweighs the loss of an extremity. There are studies available regarding the length of time of tourniquet placement. Victims will experience pain with direct pressure, wound packing, and tourniquet application. It is important to manage their expectations regarding all three techniques for controlling bleeding. The Stop the Bleed website, which we will discuss at the end of this presentation, has a wealth of information and addresses other questions. These are the basic principles that should govern your response. First, make sure the scene is, you must ensure your own safety before trying to help someone else. Next, get help. Call or have someone call 911 for assistance. Make every effort to assure help is on the way as you are proceeding to the next step. Look for bleeding. Once you have located a source, control of the bleeding will involve application of direct pressure, hacking of the wound, application of a tourniquet, or a combination of all of these techniques. The goal of this program was to recognize life-threatening bleeding and to take appropriate steps to control bleeding until help arrives. With this training, you can save lives. 
For more information, visit stopthebleed.org. This site is maintained by the American College of Surgeons and is updated frequently with new information regarding this important topic. In addition, kits are available at the Bleeding Control website. Remember, the only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. Thank you. Thank you again for watching the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma Stop the Bleed introductory video. This is the first part of course completion, and you will now need to participate in a hands-on portion, which includes direct pressure, wound packing, and tourniquet application. A Stop the Bleed instructor can facilitate this training, or you can attend an in-person course for this skills portion. You can find the course closest to you through the stopthebleed.org website. We would also like to take a moment to remind you that in order to protect yourself and prevent the spread of COVID and other communicable diseases, it is recommended that as an immediate responder, you follow local, state, and federal guidelines and ensure that you are wearing a face mask. Thank you so much again for taking the time to watch this video, and please stay safe.